Disney's Lorcana just released how to play the game. So follow me on this journey as I teach you guys how to become Illumineers. Hey everybody, it's Beer and we're in it with a Lorcana video jumping into it. You know, I'm very interested to see what's going to happen with the game. And with that, we have the how to play. So without further ado, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We're going to jump right into it because it's been a while now where we've gotten a decent amount of news on how to play, but you know, it hasn't been super clear on how exactly things are going to roll out. How much is it going to play like other card games? But we finally have those details. So to kick it off, the goal of the game is to be the first to gain 20 or more lore. How do you gain lore? What is lore? Lore are basically like your victory points, your play points, things that you're accumulating. You start with zero and you try to go up to 20. Typically, the standard way to be able to do so is via playing character cards and then exhausting them. So here we see Mickey Mouse, brave little tailor. He's got four little ink symbols at the bottom right corner that allows him to gain four lore whenever he goes questing. And you go questing by making a card turn 90 degrees to the side. This is exhausting a card. Every character with those markers at the bottom right corner is able to go on a quest once per turn to gain that allotted amount of lore. So here, if we started with zero by Sending Mickey Mouse on a quest, we gain four lore counters. Now, do note, you cannot go on a quest if it is the turn that you played a card. So if I played Mickey Mouse this turn, I would not be able to send Mickey on a quest until it is my next turn. Um, typically, this is known as summoning sickness, basically saying that the card was played and now it has to sit there for one turn before we're able to do anything with it. So to go further, let's jump into how a card breaks down. What are the different components of a card? We'll go over the different card types that there are, and then we'll break down what a turn looks like. Looking at the components of a card, it's generally standard. It's not too bad. It looks like a lot, but we'll break through it. So on every single card, the first thing you have to look at is the cost. So that is the number at the top left corner. That'll tell you how much ink you need to spend to be able to play the card. And we'll talk about how you get cards into your inkwell to be able to play cards in just a minute. Uh, the inkwell icon is the little spiral around the cost marker. So that tells you that that card can be put into your inkwell to help you pay for other costs. Then we've got the name of the character. So Mickey Mouse Wayward Sorcerer. Do note that that's the whole name. In Lorcana, you can only have four copies of a card per deck. However, different versions of a given character can all be included as four individual copies. So even though you have four copies of Mickey Mouse Wayward Sorcerer, if you had a different Mickey Mouse, like the one that we saw previously, you could include four copies of both of those for a total of eight if you would like. Then there's the classifications. So this Mickey Mouse is a Dreamborn Sorcerer. Uh, sometimes they'll have different things. This is basically just so you have more interactions. Uh, we'll see here if we take a closer look at the Mickey Mouse card, he actually interacts with a specific type of card as well. Then there's the ink. That is the color that this card is associated to. So here we have an Amethyst Mickey Mouse card. And if we see over to the right, the parts of a card where there are six different ink colors. So you have Amber, Emerald, Sapphire, Amethyst, Ruby, and Steel. Any deck can be composed of one or two ink colors at max. Then you got the abilities and effects. Those are the special rules that the card does. Uh, generally, you just have to do what the card says it does. Uh, some abilities uh, force your cards to have to be exerted or exhausted, so that's turning them again 90 degrees. Those abilities can only be used the turn after you play the character card. Once again, when the turn you play a character card, anything that forces the card to have to turn 90 degrees sideways, you cannot do that until the next turn. So here, Mickey Mouse is a three strength, four willpower characters. On top of the parts of the card that are on every card, when we're talking specifically character cards, they have those extra components. Strength being how much damage a character deals during a challenge. And challenge is basically whenever you and another character card face off face to face. Willpower is how much damage it takes before your card gets banished. So Mickey Mouse has can deal for three damage, can take for damage before he gets banished and damage is held throughout the turn so if my mickey mouse took damage this turn let's say he took two damage those two damage markers would stay on mickey perpetually at all times no matter what so it'll always have those two damage markers until there's some way to either add more either via more challenges or if there are certain ways to be able to remove markers from them and finally there's the lore values those are the markers that say how many lore points you get when you send that character on a quest and then finally on the bottom right we have the rarity key 
Lorcana will have five different rarities ranging from common, uncommon, rare, super rare, and legendary. That's mostly just there to let you know the rarity of the card that you pull. It really doesn't have impact from what we know on gameplay in any way, sense, or form. So we've looked at character cards. Now there are a few other card types. So jumping into those, of course, first we have the character card. So those are the ones that you'll be playing out in other card games. It's uh, analogous to like your creatures or whatnot here. Here in Lorcana, they are character glimmers. That's how they're specified. So you're bringing in glimmer ink versions of those characters. Then we have item cards. These are very similar to character cards in that they have abilities, they have a cost. Uh, typically, they can be placed into your inkwell. However, they don't have strength, they don't have willpower, and they can't go questing. Typically, there could be cards that always change the rules, but these cards specifically do not act like characters when it comes to things like challenges, and you can actually exhaust them on your turn that you play them. If we take Dingle Hopper here, for example, you're able to exhaust the card to remove one damage counter from a character. You're able to do that the moment you play the card. You will not have to wait. That is the benefit of item cards. So you lose a little bit in terms of not being able to use them to go questing or challenging, but you get that instant gratification of their usage turn after turn because they will stay on the board. And then finally, the third type is the action card. They give you a one-time advantage. They're one-time use. They're like magic cards, spell cards, uh, here they are called actions. You do have to be careful. Not every card can be played in your inkwell, specifically like we see with Dragonfire here. It does not have the spiraling icon around the cost. So do note you will not be able to put it in your inkwell. Additionally, on top of typical action cards, there are songs. Now, songs are an extension of actions. They are actions. However, they have the added ability that characters are able to exhaust themselves to sing a song to be able to use the card without having to pay a cost. So here we have one jump ahead. And if you have a character with a cost of two or more, they may sing this song to activate the ability. And what it allows you to do is able to ramp one into your inkwell, which means add one card into your inkwell, which means you can do it twice a turn in that turn as opposed to once. It allows you to accelerate your game plan. Again, because we're forcing our characters to exhaust to sing a card, then they cannot do it the turn they are played. So that's that's the balancing act. Songs are very powerful because they allow you to accelerate your game plan without having to pay more from your inkwell. However, they are a little bit slow in the sense that you need to have those characters on board for one full turn before you're able to do it. Now that we have a general understanding of the different card types and what to look for on a card, let's talk about how we progress and set up the game. When it comes to playing the game, you have two primary phases. You've got the beginning phase, where you'll ready up your cards. So any cards that were exhausted will now go back up. So you retilt them 90 degree facing up so that they're ready to go. From there, you have the set step. This is basically where the game looks to see if there's any abilities that need to trigger during this step. Also, when a character card is present during the set step, because hey, maybe there's a way that you played a character card on your opponent's turn or before the set step. If a character card was present during the set step, that's when it gives it the okay to be able to use its character abilities, it be able to challenge other cards, go on quests. This is the step that the game looks for to say, okay, you know what, that card, you can go ahead and do the stuff with. And then finally, there's the draw step. Uh, do note that on the first turn, the first player does skip the step, you will be able to draw a card. So you start your turn, you ready up everything, you check to see if anything's got any abilities, and then after that, you draw a card. Going from the beginning phase, we jump into the main phase and you can do whatever you want in the main phase in whichever order you want to do. So we can add our card to our inkwell. You can only do this once per turn. And again, only with cards that have the spiral icon around the cost. You can either play cards, so play more character cards, play item cards, play action cards. You can use card abilities, notably ones that are allowed to be used. So not all abilities require you to exhaust your character. You can look on the abilities and see if they do anything. And if you have a character card that has been there for a full turn cycle, then you are okay to use those as well. You can use character actions. And specifically, there are three actions that characters can use. A character action is any action that will exhaust the character. There is going on a quest, which again, they will gain the amount of lore that's equivalent to the amount of lore markers that are on the card. You can challenge another card, which is comparing our strength and willpower with other cards to try and keep the board clean 
or you can exert an ability, which then, of course, you'll be exerting the card. And once a card's exerted, that's it. It's done. It can't use more exert abilities. It can't challenge other cards. It can't go on more quests. Before we jump into what a turn looks like, you know, we, here's playing the game and we're, we're going to give an example of a turn. Let's look at challenging specifically because we haven't gone too much into detail about that one. The infographic gives us a great page, little example on how it goes. So here we have the example of Captain Hook, Captain of the Jolly Roger, and it's challenging Donald Duck bolsterous foul. So here we have the Captain Hook who has a four willpower and three strength versus Donald Duck's three willpower and two strength. So when I choose to challenge the Donald Duck, I will deal three damage to it and Donald Duck will deal two damage to me. And then we compare the willpower. So because Donald Duck has three willpower and I dealt three damage to it, Donald Duck will be banished, which means it goes from the board to your banish zone. And my Captain Hook will retain two damage. Unless I do something with it, like use an action card or something like that, that will stay on board that way. So until that changes, my Captain Hook has two damage counters on it. And the moment that reaches four or more, at that point, my Captain Hook would also go to the Banish. And again, you can only challenge other cards if your card has stayed there for a whole turn cycle. And you can only challenge exhausted cards. So if your opponent has left their card standing face up 90 degrees, you cannot challenge those cards. So with that overview in mind, we've looked at the cards, we've looked at the different things you can do with cards. How do we go about a turn? So you start to turn off by drawing seven cards from your hand. This is my example hand. Yes, I know it's not great. I'm just using cards that they've already shown off as an example. Don't worry about it. Um, if you don't like cards in your hand, you can choose as many cards as you want to put them at the bottom of your deck and draw up back up to seven. You can only do that once per game and then you shuffle your deck. Here, we'll just keep this for the sake of the example. We have these seven cards. We've got Captain Hook and Cruella de Vil. Remember, you can only play two colors max in your deck. So to start off, we're gonna start off our turn. We're the first turn player. We don't draw a card. Afterwards, we're gonna go ahead and put a Cruella in our inkwell. When you put a card in your inkwell, you reveal it to your opponent to prove that it has an ink marker in the top left corner, and then you flip it upside down and you put it down in your inkwell zone. After that, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to pay one to put our Captain Hook on the board. You don't have to worry about colors. All ink cards act exactly the same the moment in your inkwell. They don't have special abilities. They don't look for specific colors. All ink work for all cards. So here we paid the one and then we put the Captain Hook on board. Now, again, Captain Hook cannot do anything the turn he was played. You have to wait for the paint to dry. So caution, wet paint when you play new character cards. So it has to wait there. Okay, so, so far we've put a card in our inkwell. We've played a card. We're out of actions to take pretty much. So we'll go ahead and pass the turn to our opponent. Once the turn goes to our opponent and then comes back to us, we restand everything and we draw an additional card and look at there, we drew another Cruella. Crazy. <laughs> uh, from there, we go ahead and put a Cruella into our inkwell. We could have put a Captain Hook as well. It doesn't matter. Again, reveal the Cruella, show that it is an ink card, and then put it upside down in our inkwell. And now we can progress however we want. If we wanted to, we could go questing with our Captain Hook, which means turning it 90 degrees and adding one lore counter. So now we went from zero lore to one lore. And again, our goal is to get to 20. Careful, this does make our Captain Hook vulnerable for our opponent to attack into it, to challenge into it. So you have to be mindful of that. And then that's the general turn flow, right? That's how the game pans out. Uh, the biggest thing is you're both trying to get to the 20 lore counters necessary. Uh, but be mindful that there are going to be ways that your opponent and you are going to try and contest the board, right? If my opponent sees that I've gone really wide and I'm really speeding up to get as many lore counters as I can, then my opponent might be incentivized to challenge my board to try to slow me down. And then from there, it'll be that back and forth interaction on who can control the board best so that you can be the first one to accumulate all the way to 20. And to my knowledge, there's no limit on your hand size, your board size, your inkwell. So feel free to explore the gameplay however you want to there. Those are the general examples of how to play the game in terms of building your own deck. There is a minimum of 60 cards. So you need at least 60 cards in your deck for you to be able to play a game. There are four copies max of any card. Again, we've already talked about this. Different versions are okay. So if you have one version of Elsa and then you have a different version of Elsa, that is perfectly okay. You can play both of those at four copies each. 
And then there are two colors max. Of course, we've been over this and the starter decks are gonna be a great place to start. They have at least 60 cards. They're going to follow all the deck building restrictions. And like we see here, they are two color decks, which is gonna give you a lot of abilities to be able to explore what all the different ink colors do. Now, this has definitely been a quick breakdown. Um, however, they have released a more tightened up infographic. It's where I pulled a lot of the images for this in. So if you guys just Google how to play Lorcana, you guys will be able to find these infographics. I've, I've pretty much gone through most of it, but this will generally give you the overall details in terms of what to, so there's two of them specifically. There's this one, which is kind of the quick start rules, as well as this one here, which kind of goes into a little bit more details about playing a card, questing, challenging, and all of that. So we did generally cover it all here. So this video did cover all that, but if you ever want a quick infographic, I highly recommend that you guys just search it up. You should very easily be able to find it. And with that said, everybody, that is my quick start guide on how to play Lorcana. I'm so excited that we finally found out how to be able to play. I feel like we've been waiting on the sidelines for so long. We've seen cards so many months ago. And now that we're finally seeing that transition from, OK, now we have an idea of how the game plays. Every time they release more cards, we're going to have a better idea of what the color identities do and what the play strategies do. And, you know, what does the Lion King do? Because, you know, I want to play a Lion King deck. So it's super excited. I'm so glad that we know how to play. And you guys know I'm going to be so excited to get things tracked on here so that you guys know exactly what to play when the game releases. So don't forget to subscribe if you guys want to keep up with everything in terms of how to play the game, in terms of the meta, everything that's going to show is going to be very, very exciting. With that said, I'll catch you guys on the next one.